Um, a hugely warm welcome um, from WIFT International. Uh, my name is Regina and I'm a program producer for, for WIFTI. Um, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you all um, to this conversation for tonight um, with our guests, Leticia and Katina. Um, before we start, just a few housekeeping things. Um, so we have the option to ask questions in the second half of the event. Um, and feel free to write those questions at the special Q&A field, which is at the bottom of your screen. There's a little button. Um, so just write your questions there and we'll answer them um, in the second half. Um, and also, it's always nice to know who's in the room. Um, so feel free to introduce yourself um, in the chat field. Uh, just write who, who you are, where you're from, where you're sitting tonight, today. Um, uh, that's always quite nice for our speakers and for us to, to, to know who we are speaking to. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, um, I'm very happy to hand over to you, Dan Michaelis Storp um, from WIFT Australia um, to say a few words. Over to you. Thank, thank you, Regina, and thanks to WIFT International and WIFT Queensland for hosting this event. Uh, I'm going to be doing a, an acknowledgement to country. Wanya Gururimba Bingi. My name is Yudha Michaela Storp of Bidjura and Dungadi First Nations origin and Indigenous lead of WIFT Australia. I'm speaking to you today from Turrbal Yagarwa and Yagarbal country, also known as Brisbane. I wish to acknowledge their ancestors and their continued living culture that has nurtured the land, seas and skies for many thousands of years. As Aboriginal people, our ancestors are not just human. We're related to the trees, the rocks, the plants, the animals, the birds, the insects, even the stars and even the wild weather. So to be connected means we have to provide a balanced, caring and sustainable environment. In honour of all that has been lost, both sentient and non-sentient over the last week of global attacks from weather to war, I invite you to connect with your own ancestors from wherever you may be listening to with this event, as we pay our respects to the past, present and future Indigenous peoples of this planet. Thank you. I'd like to introduce or so hand over to the beautiful Katina and Leticia. Thank you so much, Michaela. So nice to have such a warm um, uh, welcome. And welcome to Katina. It's so great to be speaking with you. And once again, we had the pleasure of um, having a brief chat um, a couple of weeks back and I just couldn't wait to get back into this space um, to talk again and share so much of um, Katina's wisdom um, with everyone else. So hi. Thank you, Thank you for <laughs> having me. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> um, it's particularly wonderful to meet another um, Latin American woman who is a storyteller operating in both languages um, and who also has um, a strong um, stage practice like me. So um, I'm just thrilled that um, people get to hear about your work. Um, so I thought maybe we would start with um, talking about uh, how you came to be a, um, in, as a practicing director. Um, uh, you know, what, what drew you to telling stories? Yeah, I mean, I, my first love was theater and it was in high school. Um, there was a very big, musical theater in my in my high school and I wanted to audition but I was the worst actress so I didn't get in but they <laughs> offered me a job in scenography and I said yes just because I loved uh the whole you know uh, um the all the plays that they, they that they would do so I I said yes and I fell in love with being backstage and I fell in love with making things work and the audience not knowing that you are like pulling down the moon and you're you know changing the scenarios and stuff and it was fascinating for me and I I mean I I, I don't come from a family of artists I'm the first one but my parents were very supportive about it which I I'm really thankful for and I also loved cinema and there was these uh, cycles of cinema in Mexico from European movies that would happen twice a year and I, you would buy like a bonus ticket and you would go every day to a different movie for 10 days and I would do that all the time and I was in love with European cinema that's why I think I, I, I then studied in London but I, I figured that filmmaking was more technical and that there was more things to study 
from it than theater. Theater, I, I felt it was more about directing actors and that would I would get that from, from film. So I decided to, to, to study film and then I promised myself to go back to theater at some point because it was my, the first thing that, that drew me from there. And I worked on a set when I was still in high school without pay and it was very good for me to know and to really see if the set was for me and I was fascinated by it so that's why I ended up studying it and, and doing both things. So did you start uh, initially uh, doing like a, a degree in in performing arts or in theater and then move into screen and do a second degree or did you go straight to studying film? I studied two years of communication that's how it, they call it in Mexico which is more broad thing like uh, journalism and radio and but at some point I was like I, 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 I like the the cinema so I studied uh, in a school here in Mexico for for two years and then I applied to London Film School and I was accepted and, and I went there for the master's that it's a two-year two-year master's that it was amazing because it's a very practical school and it's also a school that you rotate from every department so you I mean I, I I operated camera I was a camera assistant I was even a grip you know I know how to put a dolly in the floor <laughs> and um, you know they, they would teach you editing and you would just like shift from jobs so that was very helpful for me to learn like what how much time it takes you know for every department to to do certain things and then when I came back I was a first AD for 12 years um, oh, wow. yeah, in Mexico for, for movies and, and TV shows and advertising while I was writing my first script, giving the jump to directing was so hard, um, more so because I'm talking about 10 years ago, eight years ago, where women were not as hot as we are now. So the, the, the opportunities weren't, weren't that great. And also I was a very good first AD and I feel that producers won't let you go you know they would keep offering AD jobs when I didn't want to do it anymore and it was very difficult just to to keep the jump and to be starting to be respected as a director or, or, or being called only as a director it took it took a while yes of course and and um were you um at that stage also practicing uh in theater were you directing trying to you know make a make a name for yourself on stage as well or were you working exclusively as a first ad and writing and moving into uh, film directing primarily i was as a first ad but the funny thing is that before i did my first film there was these actors that I knew that invited me to a showcase they did and they were directing themselves. I mean, they were like finding some texts and they would do these showcases and suddenly I was like, do you need a director? I will do it for free, you know? And they were like, yeah, sure. So they called me to do these three short plays from Tennessee Williams in a very small theater uh, downtown in Mexico. And we put money in from our pocket and we did four shows. And we, you know, charging with, with, with the, the, the tickets, we, we took the money back. And it was my first experience as a proper theater uh, thing. And it was more of a collaboration with these actors that I will be very grateful for because also it gave me confidence on knowing that I had, you know, something as a director because also like for me with like the last short film I did was in London and suddenly eight years had passed and it's like I haven't directed anything in eight years and you start doubting yourself imposter syndrome from women that we have to stop that now but that you know it's very normal and so for me it was just like going back to be director and then my first movie came um, but I I can say that I started directing professionally in theater even if it was like a very small show it started there I love that. And uh, so you talked a bit about, you know, the, that you, you know, had this anticipation about, um, you know, needing to learn the technical. Um, so you moved into film. Um, so once you had your script and you were ready to step in, did you feel like you were ready because you had also complemented uh, your craft with working with actors plus your AD uh, work. I imagine that, you know, scheduling for you was like, 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> Super and easy. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know it was going to be so handy because it is a very different job. It's a job that not, it's not creative. It's more like in organization and, and you're the soldier mm -hmm. of the set. But suddenly producers now, like I have interviews for jobs. And when I say I was first city for 10 years, like the eyes shine, you know, it's like, oh, yes, so you're, I bet. Because you're a problem solver, you know about scheduling, you you were on the other side of the crew. I'm very respectful with the crew because I hated directors that would keep you extra hours or that would, you know, do 10, 20 takes when you don't need them. And I was like very aware of that when I jumped into directing. Um, and that chip never leaves. I mean, sometimes my ADs now, it's like, you don't have to worry about that. I'm not like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, it's just me. I can't, I can't just switch it off. So, yeah. <laughs> It's been, it's been very handy. And yeah, I mean, the theater, what gave me also with the actors is I'm very still in film. My main focus is on actors more on, than on the visuals. I spend a lot of time on the visuals and stuff. But for me, the most important thing is that I believe that if the actors are well directed and are, are good, then you tell a story and you connect with the story doesn't matter if the camera is wherever. It's nice to do beautiful shots. I think the camera and the language also adds to what you're telling. And I've been learning that these past years, now that I'm in pre-production for a film, you start to think how the camera can tell you more things about the story. It's not only about a nice shot or a nice angle, but it's about what you're telling with it. And that's fascinating as well. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about um, about your films because uh, they are very human. Um, uh, they are exceptionally well performed, I have to say, and I can see that that is you, uh, that you put all your heart and um, you you create very nuanced performances from your actors and you can see that there's a freedom in their performances and naturalism that um is really uh, um, uh it, it really stands out in your work and not, not just in your films but also in your television work you can see that the actors are in a very comfortable place um so can you talk a little bit about what it was like um to make your first uh, i guess your first feature unless you want to comment a little bit about your progress through um shorts but i, I would love love to hear a little bit about the process for um you know what to do with me which was um your principal feature i suppose yeah can we call it that yeah 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 i mean that was supposed to be my first feature but for five years i couldn't get the funding it was very hard it's also very hard for a first film and female in those years just to get funding and 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 money so another film a very independent film that i shot in 15 days and with ten thousand dollars um came first so i had the credit so when i applied to the fund that's a second feature i got the money um great. so that was great but that first one that's i don't show smart. it anymore because it was it was more like an experiment i mean it, it ended up being on netflix worldwide which was a huge surprise for me because it was done with so few money but but yeah you'll know what to do with me was my first like proper film in terms of having a proper script i had amazing actors i i do a lot of not rehearsals, but I love to do in, in prose and, and I write scenes that are not in the script for the actors because there's a lot of things that come out from those improvisations that are fascinating that you hadn't seen that suddenly one of the actresses or the actors comes up with something that it's a key for another scene that we have on the film. So I do a lot of, I. I take a lot of time in, in designing the rehearsals and I'm doing it right now for the, this new film where it's about emotionality. It's about like the characters connecting to each other. So what exercises can you do to make a link between these two actresses in, in, in the case of my next film? So when we get to set, we already have some work there. And it's not only about saying the dialogues that I wrote for the scripts, but it's about all the impros that you can do or scenes that are outside the script that really gives you, um, I don't know, to put an example in, in You'll Know What To Do With Me, there's a scene where the mother is at the hospital, she took too many pills 
And then the next scene is them at the house and they have a confrontation. I improvised the car ride between those two scenes that I don't have in the movie, but I gave instructions to both of them separately of what I wanted to them for them to say. So for example, I was like, okay, let's do an improvisation. But I told the mother at some point, just criticize the clothes that your daughter has whenever you want. So I give some hints, you do the improv and a lot of things happen in that scene. Then when I came to set to do the kitchen scene, I was like, let's remember that improv in the car this and this and this. So they enter with something that they already lived or acted and it brings like so much more layers to it. I love that. So when, when you're, uh, so when do you schedule that? How do you schedule those kinds of improvisations? Is it in during pre, is it yeah. on set? No, 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 no. In pre-production, pre-production. I mean, instead of rehearsing, because that, that's the difference between also theater and film with theater. Yeah, and right. I've spoken about this with actors and it's very funny because it's like in theater, you only rehearse once and twice. I mean, it's all about repetition. It's all about memory. It's all about rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing. And in film, if you rehearse the scenes, you lose some nature, you know, like, yeah, something happens there. Yes. Yeah. So even actors say, yeah, you rehearse theater, you don't rehearse film. But then in film, I do all these things around it to just mm -hmm. having backstory and to talk about the scenes that it's something that not everybody does like like the table reads that in theater before you stand up to to do the the, the play there's a like many weeks that you spend with the actors talking about every single thing that is said in the play I do it the same with the movies just mm -hmm. to talk about it to ask questions how did you read it because it's very interesting to see also how the actors bring certain things that you haven't seen. And it's important to have all that information before. And also the backstories. I'm very, like, I'm always doing albums or, I don't know, my next movie, one of the women suffers infertility and she's like on her seventh IBF. And what I did was an album with images and phrases of all the process from the first one Till this one where the movie starts because I wanted the actress to see and know what the character has been through all mm -hmm. these years so she has all that charge and I do playlists with music so they can read the script with certain mood which is the playlist that I wrote the script so there's a lot of outside thing that is more about sensations and information and backstory that it's it's super interesting and and I think that actors the more information they have the better they get to set with their own characters so really it's about building building a world with them that gives them you know the playing field or the parameters to play within and then generating more richness and detail together exactly I love that that's a that's a beautiful process that's wonderful and what happens then if um, in situations like um, where you're coming in to something that's already been established, like um, Emily in Paris? Well, can you talk about the difference? Yeah, it's 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 tricky because you enter a production that is already ongoing. There's not a lot of time of pre-production with the crew. I mean, and all the shows that I've done, the DP is the DP of the whole show. So you don't even prepare with the DP, which I find it very, very difficult. I'm a very collaborative di director and I love, I mean, right now, all my meetings of the shooting with my DP are precious, you know. Um, but it's fascinating for me also because it's 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 about blending in but bringing your own view but you have to be like the actors don't know you I always reach for the actors to have like a dinner or a coffee or something before shooting not all the time is possible but but most of the time they're willing to do it and that's nice so you don't meet them and then say action on the day um, mm -hmm. and to talk about the characters and stuff and it's it's tricky, but it's super nice because you do have to follow certain language of cameras and stuff. You don't do that, but there is a lot of room of bringing your point of view, I feel. And there's a lot of room on setting certain shots. And if you're lucky enough that the showrunner is something that someone that is open to 
to suggestions, you know, there's always room for you to say, you know, this is, this scene is maybe a bit aesthetic. Why don't we, you know, have movements doing this or this? And I do feel that when you watch TV series or at least, I don't know if, if like audience in general, but I do see differences between directors, even though it doesn't jump in a unity of the show, but you can tell there's a gaze and a different gaze. And I find that fascinating. And I, I feel that when you're doing TV or, or at least on my side, I try to, to bring my own view there. Mostly it's with the actors, because I do feel that that's the broader room that you have for change because direction, I mean, even if I want to do handheld, but the show is not handheld, it's okay. But my approach to the actors is exactly the same as in my films, you know, and there's always yeah. very, I'm very precise with notes and I really like to, to get in there and to be very detailed with them. And I've, I've been having great experiences that the actors really love that and, and they appreciate it. So. And Katina, do you, would you um, say that you would also request rehearsals in pre-production for an episodic um, show? I wish there's, I never had time for that because mm. we're shooting. So the most thing yeah. that I have, it's a uh, reading of the script, but mm -hmm. literally without stopping and without notes and just like a, just to read the script that it's more just for the writers it. than for the director. Um, mm -hmm. But there's no time. I mean, if you do the pilot, of course, and that happens. But when you are doing episodic and you're coming in the middle, there's no time ever to do it. Which yeah. Is the so shame. the best you can hope for is that dinner and a coffee. And ah! <laughs> and the last me. one I did, I didn't even have that because they were shooting every day the the two leads, and I could, I met them on set, mm. and it was so difficult because directing actors you there's no rules and there's no not an one approach <clears throat> actors are human beings and every human being reacts differently to life and to certain things so there are actors that are more physical there are actors that are more emotional there are actors that love the intellectualizing you know the psychology of the characters there are actors that hate that and they just want to have instructions on how to move there are actors that love to propose things there are actors that love for you to tell them what to do and and actors who don't like anything at all <laughs> exactly but then if you don't know them and you just arrive to set you start to know them while you're directing and it's very hard because it's like if i knew you at least like one or two days then i knew i would know how to approach you you know and you just have to deal with that and it's fascinating for me because it's also about like reading humans and, and, and yeah. knowing yeah. what they what they respond to and you know certain actors will give you you know surprises some others less and you learn to navigate and, and 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 you don't talk to every actor the same way and that's why also I feel because I I felt in London there wasn't enough classes about directing actors and I was like so keen about it, like, why is this? And now I know because there's no rules. I mean, there are certain things that you can learn. There are certain books. The Judith West on directing actors is a book that every director should read. For me, it was very, very helpful for my first film. Mm -hmm. But then it's a lot about human to human thing and, and how you approach them and how they react to, act, to to directions and how detailed you can be. So that's, yeah. that's fascinating. <clears throat> but one, one, I suppose um, you, you would get an opportunity to spend a bit of time with obviously producers and, and the showrunner. And yes. I suppose that's a very important relationship that you need to nurture as you're going through your process in pre-production and leading into obviously the shoot and then into post. Can you comment a bit about that? Yeah, super important. I mean, more so in the US, there's certain like rules and processes that they take very seriously. And the tone meeting is exactly that. It's a meeting with the showrunner where you go scene by scene, talking about the tone, talking about suggestions. I am very nerd and a geek and I prepare a lot because as a first AD, I, I, I knew that information was golden and that if you really prepare then on set, you can improvise and you can do certain things, but with a plan. 
And so what I do always is that all my suggestions come out in pre-production because I like to have approval before and not mm -hmm. coming to set and doing something that suddenly the showrunner is like, why are you doing, I don't like this, you know? And then you, you miss time. I mean, in TV, you should double the scenes than in, in cinema. Yes, you have two cameras, but still the rhythm of television, it's so fast that you can't waste time. So for me, it has been very helpful to have all my suggestions in pre-production. Maybe, yeah, there will be some ideas that come through on sets, but it's the few. And then if you have all that, or if some suggestion, the showrunner is like, no, 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 we can't do that. Then you, you don't go and try it. You know, I mean, you, you, you've discussed it before. So it's very important to be very communicative. And I've been lucky enough to have showrunners that are, you know, buying most of my ideas and they like, you know, jump in into your view and it's, that's been very nice and helpful. Okay, great. That's a, that's a really fantastic tip um, yeah. because, you know, you, that's the one thing that you, you don't want to do is end up with uh, surprises where everybody's like, what happened? <laughs> exactly. And then you have to improvise right there with a hundred people looking at you what are we doing now? And you know, you just put yourself in a position of stress that is unnecessary. Yeah. And because you have to uh, learn, you have to learn, sorry, because I think it's, you have to learn that TV shows is not your show and your film. If you're a showrunner, you will, but this is a work for hire. And I feel that a lot of directors are really fighting that because it's like, I'm an artist, I know what I'm doing. And it's like, well, this is a show from someone else. And I feel that the quicker you learn that, the better you navigate it without suffering it. And you, I mean, I always have this phrase for myself on set is like, when I do my movie, I'll do it differently, you know, but right now I have to do it as, you You're know. You're doing someone else's movie. Way. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, can we talk a little bit about then what it means to go back to your own work and be making your own movies, um, handpicking your creative team? Uh, um, to, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, the I, I guess, the freedoms that are um, permitted when you're making your own films. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fantastic because, yeah, you, you get to choose <clears throat> everything. In TV, sometimes it's like, you have to do a close-up and you're like, but the scene is about this distance, you know, why, why are we doing a close, but they ask for it and I have to do it. And it's very nice right now to say, she's going to be on her back. We're going to see her face. And I decide that. And that's, that's amazing. And how you also set the tone for something because I've worked like my first show, the tone that they have, it was so difficult. I mean, I, I just didn't get it. So it's very difficult to, direct something that you don't set the tone to uh, when it's like a bit off uh, and and also to choose the language of the camera but funnily enough the shows that I've done are super big productions with all the equipment and my films are so indie that you don't I mean in Emily in Paris I had Steadicam every day and I could use it and I was like oh my god in my film, I have to choose two days out of 30 to have a steady cam because I don't have more money. So on one hand, you get to be more creative on how you shoot and how you simplify things and how you do things low cost without compromising your work. And on Emily in Paris, for example, having all these things, my mind was going on oh my God, I can, I can do any shot I want, you know? I mean, I can do the crane that comes and, and does mm -hmm. this. So your mind goes also very creative, but in a different way. I feel that you learn more with indie and I think it's more difficult because I feel that when you have all the toys, then yeah, your mind has to think big, but you can have anything, you know? And on indie films, it's like, okay, how can I tell the story? in a simple way or in a, in a in a cheap way in terms of money but that still you know is telling the story and you get more creative 
on solving those kind of things you suffer a lot as well because it's like two days but I need three and then you know I'm just fighting on the schedule to put the scenes together of which ones I want to study cam but um, I feel also it gets you to go deeper on the story and on the actors yeah. which it's it's yeah. what I like so yeah that's that's the big difference I would say yeah that's great um I suppose you're also um uh, are, are you are you working with the same uh, creative team that you've worked on in, in the past? Do you already have a shared language or is it all new people that you're working with or? It's all new people. I mean, I think only the sound recordists is the same. I wanted a female crew and I got mm -hmm. it. So I have a female, oh! DP, female DP, female production designer, costume, makeup, editor, producer uh oh wow. yeah it's all women i i was very keen on doing that i i wanted to do that um and i found such talented women and also i our budget is very tight so also it was difficult to get certain crew to work um in the because also netflix and they're paying really well and then suddenly filmmaking is like for the love of art and some people is like I you know they're paying me triple on that show so I'm, I'm leaving so funnily enough is they are also quite young I mean I'm, I'm 40 and they're like 35 it's not like super super young but they are younger which has been very nice to see a really fresh view and we really you know we're working together super nice and I'm I'm I think I have the crew that I needed to tell the story and also because the story it's a very female driven story so it was important for me for the crew to be invested and connecting with with what we were telling katina um what sort of um resources do you use in in your planning and your pre-production do you do you use um shot designer are you that meticulous or do you create storyboards how do you like to work what Storyboards in my brain, in my brain don't work, but floor plans do. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I do a shot list and I draw the floor plans like from a top shot and I put the camera and I and I draw the my drawings are like a five year old girl <laughs> drawings. But, you know, <laughs> in the end, I think everybody kind of understands. And if there's a dolly, I draw the dolly and, you know, just to know because there there is a lot of sequences in filmmaking you don't shoot chronological so if you don't have I mean you know many things happen through your mind so I think the more prepared you are even though if you change everything when you arrive there and more so in tv producers love that you know they love a prepared director that not knows what she's doing you know and also to be very precise in hours and not having extra hours and stuff it has to do with with preparation and that all the crew knows what you're doing and and and, and you know then you, and then you prepare so yeah I do I do shot list of everything I do floor plans and now if I have the chance I take pictures of the angles and I attach them to the whole thing so we know that we're looking to the window or we're looking you know so I I, I, I prepare that yeah Mm -hmm. um so and you also mentioned that on projects like the grand scale projects like um emily in paris or selena uh you didn't get an opportunity to work with your dp so i imagine that your preparation is even deeper more more detailed um than that do you get any time at all or do you just turn up on set and go hey here's my plan do you want to have a quick look or they have been always very available but it's like Sunday which is also their free day so you don't want to you know because it's exhausting to be shooting and they like read the scripts on the Saturday night that they came out from shooting it's it's, it's insane but I've been very lucky on having DPs that are really keen on meeting but as you say like I'm doing my shot list right now with my DP together all of it and in TV then I do a shot list and then I come with the ideas and then they either add to it or they say, for example, that angle we've seen a lot, but this angle is new on Selena's house, for example, no? And that was very helpful to have. Um, but I had to learn more about 
language and camera because that doesn't come as easy to me as directing actors. And I feel that every director has its, you know, easier things that come to you. Like I get notes in my head as soon as I'm watching the actors and sometimes people is like, how did you get that note? It's just, they just come to me. And all the, the camera work has been harder for me. And it's a lot about studying the shows that you like and, and, and seeing certain angles. And also, as I was saying, learning how the camera can help. To give a very quick example, my movie is about these two characters that are, are at the beginning, they're like starting to know each other. They're, there's a bit of fights and then they kind of connect and come together. And we are planning on not having two shots for the first part. Like they won't be on the same shot ever we are separating them there's always singles right. there's no right. even over the shoulder because that gives you more intimacy and we are doing that for the first part and then when they start connecting then we're going to have these two shots then they are together and it's a, a simple example of how language can add to you where do you put a dolly why is the camera moving um is it an accent why are you doing a close-up that on tv Sometimes it's more about covering than doing that. And, and you can do it in certain scenes, but it's lovely to do it in a movie. Now I'm enjoying that work so much because I'm right now doing the shooting. And it's so nice to say, you know what, this dialogue, we can't see the face. We need to see the reaction of the other one and how do we shoot this. But it has been more difficult. And that's why I love theater because theater takes out the camera of your mind because that takes a lot of information and time from you and you are only you know with the actors and I love that also just and you're like, just playing just in the no wide camera. yes <laughs> only the actors and that's that's beautiful yeah absolutely um I, I'm interested in um in your comment about notes um because I have found on occasion that uh, you can give a note and you're very confident about that note and then you you might give it and it's like a moment of rehearsal, like you were saying that suddenly the spark might, um, might not ha happen again because it's like you, you put your foot in it, you know, and like you've, it's, it's tricky, so that balance, isn't it? Do you find? It's very tricky and in my experience, it depends on the actors. If you have good actors, notes are fantastic and they take it like one more step and it's fascinating to watch. Mm -hmm. And because good actors really like notes and they like the detailed notes and they like how maybe you come with a, an idea that changes the view of the scene and it's fascinating. But it has happened to me that actors that maybe either don't have much experience or I mean I, I work with actors that they feel that you giving notes is telling them you're doing it wrong so they get very insecure and it's like no I'm just adding to it I'm helping mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. to you know take the best out of a performance but it doesn't mean you're not doing it right you know it's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. but there are actors that are more defensive uh, I think in the in the book of Judith Butler she says never um don't give more than three notes per take because then it's too much. And I always struggle because I always have tons of notes and I, you know, I start choosing them. And it was very funny because with Lily Collins, she was laughing at my process because what I do is that I have the sites and I have my pencil. So I do the notes. I go to the set with the actors. I, I, I give the notes and then I erase them and I start over. Yeah. And then if they you know, they do it again. And then sometimes I have new notes. Sometimes they didn't do what I want. So it's another note. But she was like, I, I love that you start over. Like it's, you know, it's every take has its own notes. And suddenly, yeah, you have to ask for just the, these two. And then, you know, you choose to, to do the other two, because if not, it can, yeah. be, it can be too much. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you about um, some of the challenges that um, you had to endure through being a filmmaker or in a stage director during the pandemic. And oh, that, wow. what was that like for you? What, what, um, what worked and what didn't work about all the protocols that were put in place, do you think? No, I, everything is awful. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I mean, the only thing that works is that I got jobs out of Zoom and not having to fly to Los Angeles. I mean, that's the yeah. only thing that I would say that was amazing because maybe I wouldn't have gotten the jobs before the pandemic and I would have to be in person. And for mm -hmm. me to be paying trips to LA to have meetings is just unpayable. Um, but it's horrible. Like, like I, I, I spoke to my producer. I was like, I can't choose actors over Zoom. That's not going to happen. I need to see them. I need to feel them. I need to see them physically. So for all the, the leads of the movie, we did testing and we, we did that. But the other thing is that directing with a mask and actors mm -hmm. not being able to see your face and not read the room in terms of she's smiling, she's happy, how you come to set. I mean, I all the time I was like, I'm smiling, guys. I'm super happy. You have to tell that, you know, you can touch them. I'm very, I'm a Latina as well. So I'm very, you know, like <laughs> embracing them. So, and suddenly they don't understand you because you have the mask. It's awful. It's yes. awful because I feel that even though the eyes, are very expressive, not having the whole face with the actors, it's off. I mean, with the crew, you make it work. And it's, I don't think it's it's so such a difficult thing, but with the actors for me, it happened to me in, in Emily in Paris that I, I met most of the actors before, but not the secondary actors. And so we were shooting already like for 10 days. And one day I take my mask off like, And I tell the actor, I'm smiling. And he was like, oh my God, I didn't know your face. Because I didn't follow you on Instagram or anything. And it's the first time I see your entire face. And I think the nose is a very telling, you can imagine, you, you start imagining faces, you know, underneath the masks. Yes. And you don't get to see the faces of your crew. I think that's horrible. I think so too. It's very frustrating. And it's always a bit of a shock when you finally see a full face. You're like, oh, it's a shock. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but having a mask 12 hours a day, it's exhausting. I do feel that you get tired more. You're breathing your own thing. You just get it off for half hour for lunch. And it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. 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 Uh, and have, um, Has it become um, uh, uh, mandated in, on most of your sets where people must be vaccinated? Do you know? Is that, is that part of Netflix? Now? I believe it's a mandate. You can't work yeah. for any project from Netflix without being vaccinated. I mean, in my case, in Emily in Paris, I came there when it was still, everything was closed and they were starting to get vaccination. So there was a lot of, crew yeah. that wasn't but for example it happened to me that I was vaccinated I got to do it before going and my driver tested positive on my first day of shoot and it was Ugh. the drivers they have this crystal you're wearing a mask he's looking he doesn't talk to you like but yeah. still and I was driving that van with my first AD. My first AD wasn't vaccinated and I was, and the protocol mm -hmm. from Netflix was, we have to take your first AD, but you can keep working. If not, they would have stopped the set or bring another director to direct my scenes for those days. So just being vaccinated, there were, I mean, I didn't have my first AD for my first day of shoot, which was crazy, but mm -hmm. you know, the I'm protocol bad. was like, because you're vaccinated, then you can keep working. And that was great. So we didn't stop. Everything yeah, else. that's um, that's good to know. Very yeah. good to know. Um, you brought up uh, being Latina on set. <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you think uh, your heritage plays into into your work? Do you do you feel like? I mean, I know that we're not always aware of it, but sometimes in certain contexts, I imagine that you know a lot of hands. <laughs> start But flowing that, yeah I think we're warmer I'm so I mean we are and I've found that crews and cast loves that the the cercanía the the, the closeness that you Loveness. get with them and not only physical as hugging or stuff but but how you approach certain things um I I did get comments on that, like, you know, I mean, and more so from the French, that was very funny because I, I didn't know what to expect from, from a French crew and cast because I thought the French have these, uh, everybody talks about like they're very tough and they're like always kind of 
angry and stuff. They were lovely and they're very Latinos and I didn't expect that. And all of the other directors were American and they were like, we love them, but there's something about you being a Latina that really resonates on how we work. In the US, I feel that it's more about the work, but in Mexico and in France, for example, it's more about the artistry and about how people really love. I mean, I'm not saying in America they don't love what they do, but I feel it's more strict, it's more square. It's everybody's like, in a way, and that's why it sets on their work so well, you know? Um, yeah. The French, because there was, these these American guy from the crew that well oh, they're they're too sensitive you know you 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 ask for things and the Mexicans are very sensitive as well in terms of you get very sensitive if someone talks to you a bit more you know straightforward so that was that was lovely <laughs> to to live with them because I really I think I blended in and also the actors were like oh you're sweet you know you're 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 talkative and 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 I think that's that's been very nice and in Canada the last one I shot there it was a Canadian crew and it was lovely as well Canadians are amazing and they are like lovely people um and yeah I think it has helped well Katina let's hope you get to make work here in Australia I think you're gonna like them very much um my my father has always said that uh the only thing that makes the australians just not being full human is the kiss on the cheek at the beginning of a of a greeting (laughs) everything else is amazing (laughs) i need to go because i think it's the only place that kind of competes with mexican beaches so i Uh need to go it's true check them out it's true (laughs) (laughs) we have amazing ones so yeah i would i know extraordinary um uh uh, katina we might open the floor up uh we've got about 15 minutes a little bit less because we've gone over because we've had such a nice time hearing about your work um to audiences so um regina do you want to jump in yes absolutely um we have a question from kelly um and she would love some insights from katina on directing emily in paris um what were katina's biggest takeaways from directing emily in paris Well, first of all, as a Latina director, I was getting only jobs that talk about Latinos, which on one hand, we want to sell our stories and it's your view and it's your experience. But it was very important for me to have a job that it was international and that had nothing to do with my culture to really people to see that you can direct anything. You're a director and you can direct anything and it's about human emotions that are universal and how you can tell stories that doesn't have to be like super close to home and I think that's fantastic um it was very funny because I I I was a Latina trying to save the money so they loved me for it but they were like ask for what you want I was like I can use a crane the same day so you just rent it one day and they're like what do you want so that was like a huge thing and I think one of the most difficult part was that I had a lot of scenes in French because when when the, when Lily is not on, on, on the scenes, they were in French. And it was just like, I was trying to see the translation, seeing them acting, and then my notes started coming in Spanish. And so my brain was just like completely gone. And I had to trust the actors saying, I want this reaction when you're saying this dialogue and just hoping that that would happen. So I think that was one of the most challenging um, bits, but it was such a lovely show. The actors are amazing. The producers were amazing. Uh, I really, I really felt very supported, which is not easy to get. I feel as women filmmakers, we're always trying to prove ourselves. Or that's like the feeling you have that you have to prove ourselves double and you have, and and and, then, and that the first approach is kind of their doubting. I mean, let's give her the opportunity. Let's see if she can make it. And on this show, they were like, and for me, it was huge. I, I didn't have one credit outside Mexico. Like Selena is done in English, but it was shot in Mexico with Mexican crew. So this was huge. This, this was, you know, it was a long shot. My agent, remember, told me, you're not going to, I mean, I hope you get it, but it's going to be very difficult, but your name is there and now there's an interview and suddenly we got it and it was just like a huge thing. So, um, yeah, it, it, it was amazing that there was a lot of trust, even though I didn't have the credits 
um, that that's something that I've learned as well on how they choose you. They choose for your view and for who you are. And I wasn't expecting that. I thought it was all about the curriculum and it's not because I hadn't done comedy. I didn't have credits in English. I hadn't worked outside Mexico. Those three things for me was like, they're not gonna pick me. And they picked me because of my view of the show, because I said certain things that resonated with them and because they liked the vibe, I guess, and they liked my movie, but it was very nice to see that they choose you for who you are and how you see the world. And that, that's lovely. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Leticia, shall we take another question from the audience? Oh yes, yes. Sure. Um, so Amit um, is wondering, what's Katina's advice for actors who have written their own script for series or film and want to act in it as well as direct it? Is it good thinking to act in your project as well as directing it? Or should you always find a director who can direct your project if you want to act in it? I think, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of actors now going to directing, but they're actors that have a lot of experience. I feel, and because one of my first jobs as a first AD was with an actor that he directed and acted, and he told me I would never do this again. And that's Gael Garcia, which is one of the best actors in Mexico. It's a very difficult thing if you don't have, I would say I wouldn't do it for the first time. Like, maybe direct without acting and then you go into that. I feel it's very difficult to be objective on, the, on, on giving yourself notes. Also, it's challenging because it slows down the set because you act in it and then you go to the monitor and you put playback and then you have to direct everyone else. And in the same time, you have to auto direct you. I, I find it very challenging and I feel few people can do it. Of course it can be done, but I would say maybe not as the first experience. Maybe it's nice for you to direct first certain things that you're not acting and then having a lot of jobs of acting and then putting them together. I mean, you see in Handmaid's Tale that now Elizabeth Moss directs episodes and her episodes are fantastic. And I mean, I was so shocked to see like, it, it was so good. But when you hear her in interviews, she's like, I did four seasons of that TV series, really looking for where the camera is going and stuff until I like put myself to direct there. So I feel that that experience it's, it's or you now see Maggie Gyllenhaal, but Maggie didn't act in the movie. I feel also that it's very nice to, to direct something where you don't act and, and so you can leave the directing chair place in a fully, way and not dividing yourself between acting and directing that that would be my take on that i would add to that that if you must do it <laughs> because you really want to do it um and i'm with katina then i would strongly urge you to find a director that you love but if you choose to do your own directing and performing i would say get yourself a really really um trustworthy crew people who will have your back and make space yeah. and actually schedule your shoot so that you do have that time put aside so you can run to the monitor and correct whatever you need to correct if you're not satisfied with what you're seeing. Um, and um, uh, I, I, it's, yeah, I mean, it would be really important to have a very strong network around you to be able to pull that off because it is incredibly difficult and very stressful and and very time consuming yeah i agree amazing we have another question maybe to both of you um can you speak to how you handle stressful situations any self-care tips maybe i believe that the vibe on set is everything i hate shouting i hate i think it's more stressful even um sometimes it happens because the light is coming out and it's like let's hurry up and it happens but i i feel that also and it's it's very funny because i i think i got more stressed being an ad than directing i feel that in directing it's like this is what i got you know and this is what i'm doing with what i have i mean it's not you know and I think it's age as well, that <laughs> you don't wanna be so stressed and suddenly it's like, well, you know, 
you you, you have to solve it with, with, with what you have. I feel that it's very important that even if you're stressed, the respect to your crew has to be full on all the time and because then people will respond to you. So it's very, I do think that it's a, you have to be very emotionally prepared as well. I think uh, as a person also to not have this sudden mood swings or, 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 you know, and I think the directors from years ago were applauded even though they were super tough. And I think that's ending now. I feel that now productions are like, we like nice people. We don't like, I mean, even if they're silented, they are getting to the crew or the service in the, you know, it's work. So I just think that, that even if it's stressful, you should always, your crew is someone that helps you. So you just, have to you know pull up the sheep with them yeah um i would add uh, for me um I mean, obviously the, everybody has different strategies but i'm i'm very much like uh, katina and that i try to over prepare uh so that you know i'm i i know that um people will trust me if i'm ready and mm -hmm. i have answers i sometimes don't have um all the answers and one of the um, best bits of advice that I got from another director was uh, to own the response, I don't know yet. <laughs> I will that's know, but I don't know yet. Um, and that's okay. Um, and I think also uh, one of the crew, two crew members that, you know, are your life source or uh, your first AD and your continuity person. And I think um, keeping that communication going mm -hmm. so that you know where, you know, that you're, that you're meeting all of the beats, the story beats that you need to capture and that, you know, you're, you're managing your time is really important. But sometimes you just can't, you, you just have to surrender because getting angry, getting frustrated is That's not going to make it's not going to give you any more time right it's not going to yeah. make the sun go down slower it's not it's not going to make the rain stop um yes it is a stressful job it is a very stressful job but i think um trying to maintain your cool and um uh, and and think um carefully about the choices that you're making do you really need that extra thought do you you need to know that you got it when you shot it um, and what you were looking for, you know, otherwise you're just chewing up time and really it's on you. So yeah. that I think trust your process, trust yourself, trust your crew and respect, respect for your, for the people that you're working with. Cause you're, you're all doing the same job. Yes. Thanks uh, very much. Sorry, Leticia. <laughs> Shall we take uh, one, one last audience question? Yeah, I think there's just enough time for one more. Okay, look. Um, so Maya is wondering, how do you think the industry is adapting to a new subscription slash video on demand landscape, which I guess has really kind of sped up in the last two, three years? Um, what does that mean creatively to you? That's a tricky one because if it's an original one and they're putting the money, then there is a lot of restraints and more so with, for example, casting and they want to, I mean, and I, Mexico, it's a tricky country for that because we are raised on telenovelas. We apparently can't manage of going out from there. So telenovelas and comedies, it's been very hard for me, for example, now doing the drama to sell it to someone to have a bit more money to produce it because it is a drama. They don't want dramas because people here apparently they don't watch dramas, you know, and it's more about uh, comedy and about uh, kind of telenovelas with melodramas, with stories that are not really good. I mean, it's been happening to me that the projects that I get offered, I'm not interested in because the stories are not like deep enough or the things that I want to tell. And it's kind of depressing but in the end the people that put the money kind of own you which is that's why funds work better because those funds you apply with your scripts and if it get, gets chosen they are not telling you what to do on the other hand there's a lot of movies that are 
being produced because of that. So that makes more industry and that makes more jobs to the country, which is good as well. And I do feel that there has to be a broad, I mean, you need to have cinema for everyone. Not everyone wants to reflect on something. Someone wants to just escape reality and stuff. But I do feel that it's a balance on that and that streamers are having like a lot of power right now, which is great for some bits and on the others i think if you're not quite on or scorsese or someone that really has freedom of doing what they want then you are a bit more tied up on certain things that they are going to ask but then you you're doing a movie because they're giving you the money so it's it's a balance there yes i i have to agree with patina uh you know and in in our country um the streamers have you know, really expanded the market, and there's so so many exciting new projects and opportunities uh, um, for new voices, new identities um, that we haven't seen on screen before. Um, but you know, the age-old question still re remains: who is at the top of the food chain, and who is you know having that final say? And sometimes diversity can look good on paper um, but it's not always right across the the you know chain of power and so you know in the end you know some compromises are made that you weren't expecting which is sometimes a bit of a shock <laughs> yeah um but you know overall i think the streamers are are an exciting kind of um uh landscape that's created a lot of a lot of really wonderful job opportunities no, for me, TV, because before TV in Mexico, at least, the only thing that you could do to pay the rent was advertising. And that's another hold and that, that I didn't like at all. And it was very frustrating. And suddenly on TV, it's like I'm telling stories. I'm yeah. directing actors, even though the scripts yeah. might not be your film and what you want. But it is you are telling stories. And so for me, TV came to save us in that sense where you can get good money by still directing fiction and not having to do yeah. something that you don't like. I, I think our session has come to an end, unfortunately, um, but uh, it's been an absolute joy to hear you speak, Atina, uh, and uh, we wish you all the very, very best for your upcoming film. Um, and we can't wait to see more of your work on um, on our screens. Thank you so much. It was it was lovely. Good. Yeah. Also from from us at Wifty, huge thank you to the two of you for sharing so kindly and so generously um, all your knowledge. Um, thanks to Wift Australia for putting this together. Um, that's been absolutely amazing. Um, thanks to Ludan and and Carolina, uh, and also of course um, thanks to everybody. Welcome who uh, joined um, tonight or in morning in Australia and in afternoon in, um, in, in Mexico and, and the US. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and also feel free to stay in touch with um, WIFT International on our homepage. Um, there will be more conversations coming up um, this spring leading up to the summer. So um, more inspiration to come. So that's us for today. Um, Huge thanks to everybody, and I hope you, you have a lovely rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, uh, and a good night as well. So, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And goodbye. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.